Hello everyone, it's Beescape, and welcome to the top 10 comebacks in speedrunning. If I had to use one word to describe these speedruns, it would be clutch. Having a sick late game to make up for any lost time in the early to mid game, and then pulling a PB or world record out of nowhere is insane. This just goes to show that no matter how a speedrun might start out, there's always the possibility of having a sick comeback. So today, we're going to be looking at prime examples of this exact thing. Some of these comebacks also include some wild YOLO strats being implemented, so watch until the end, you won't want to miss them. Of course, this video isn't limited to the entries featured, so if you know of any other great comebacks in speedrunning, let us know in the comments section. First up we have Torge's speedrun of The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time in the old any% route that doesn't use stale reference manipulation. So Torge is a longtime runner of the game, and this specific run was back in May of 2016, when the world record was 17 minutes and 45.8 seconds by Skater. This run only had one notable time loss, and it was during his third split where he was supposed to run up to the chest, side hop off into the hole that leads to floor B1 of Deku Tree, and jump slash the wall in a two frame window to recoil himself off of the wall and land on the upper level of the basement. When Torge went for the jump slash to skip B1, Link's sword went through the wall completely without recoil, which meant that he had to go for a backup strat of lining himself up with the setup from the wall to jump up to where he was supposed to land after the jump slash. This cost about 10 seconds, which was brutal considering he was supposed to save 7.5 seconds here compared to his PB. With a super optimized game such as Ocarina of Time, it would normally be really difficult to PB in this scenario, but for the rest of the run, Torge basically made no mistakes. After finishing the collapse section, he saved about 4 seconds, which brought his best possible time to just 1 second under his PB. His last split would be extremely hard to keep up with. Since his PB was his fastest Ganon time ever, he would have to either match that or have a faster time completely. So he ends up doing this. Dude, what? Okay. I am half a second away from record right now. Half a second with a missed B1 skip. He golds the last section again and achieves a new personal best. He was only half a second away from the world record at the time with a missed B1 skip. So just imagine had he hit it, he would have smashed the world record by over 10 seconds, which at the time, would have been insane. Before we continue, I would like to give a shout out to today's sponsor who made this video possible, and it's AFK Arena. Don't worry, it's way better than Raid Shadow Legends. AFK Arena, developed by Lilith Games, is a strategic mobile online RPG, and players can build up a personalized team and level up with the unique AFK Awards auto farming system. Unlike traditional RPG mobile games, AFK Arena is a rewarding, non-grindy RPG that doesn't require an enormous time investment. The game is the best RPG for busy you, and it's also the perfect side game to play while playing other PC or console games. There are more than 40 million players worldwide, and the game has appeared on the best-selling list in the App Store and Google Play. There are tons of heroes to collect and level, with the two most recent additions being the new Celestial and Hypogean Elite heroes, Zafriel and Lucretia, who are free and available for alternative choice. The game is free, and you too can prevent an ancient evil from destroying the realm of Vesperia. If you're looking for a new casual mobile game to play, there will be a link in the description and in the pinned comment, and also a couple of bonus codes to get awesome rewards, which will totally kickstart your journey in the game. Anyways, let's get back to the video, and I hope you all enjoy. Next up we have the Blacktastic speedrun of Mega Man 9, the any% percent Proto Man category. Proto Man mode is a tougher run compared to any percent, since Proto Man takes double damage and double knockback on everything, you need to save every pellet of life that you possibly can. One of the first crucial points of the run is during the Galaxy Man boss fight. There are two patterns where Galaxy Man is low enough to the ground, making it possible to kill him in one attack phase. For the first couple seconds, it looks like Bobby got decent RNG, but then Galaxy flat out says no, and flies back into the air, costing a few seconds. Now with this pattern in particular, there was a bit of time save since he was able to get in a good amount of damage, but he's still in the red behind by a couple of seconds, when he could have been ahead in the run at this point. The next obstacle is traversing through the Plugman stage almost perfectly with a specific route. It can cost about 7 seconds, or sometimes more, if the type platforming needed for this level is not precise. He pulls off a perfect plug run, so now he has time to breathe until the Wily stages, which is the most crucial part of the entire run. He saves 4 seconds after the first level of Wily's castle, and he's finally in the green, making up for all lost time. The shark submarine level is pretty standard, and he saves another 2.5 seconds here. Now it's time for the late game, first of which is Twin Devil, and it's a complete gauntlet. If you don't kill Wily 3's boss on the first attack cycle, you can lose up to 25 seconds, so yeah, it's a run killer. Pause buffering is used to aid in this process, since pausing in Mega Man 9 cancels weapon shots. 
Switching to the black hole bomb immediately after hitting a boss with another weapon allows the boss to be hit during the boss's invulnerability window. After some pause buffering, Bobby saves an enormous 10 seconds on this fight. The world record at the time was 30 minutes and 20 seconds, and since Bobby's PB was a 30-29, coupled with the fact that he was ahead by 12.7 seconds, he would have to play almost perfectly for the last 4 minutes for hopes of a world record. Everything from this point was pretty good, not really any notable time losses. The only thing standing between Bobby and a new world record was the Wily Capsule fight. We got the world record! We got the world record! Legacy Collection 2, and that is a 3018. Two seconds below. Two seconds below the world record. Two seconds below. Here we have Paper Mario speedrun of Super Mario Sunshine, the 120 shines category. This run is quite legendary since it was the first sub 2 hour and 58 minute run, and he's been grinding down the category even further, with his current PB slash world record, clocking it at 2 hours, 56 minutes, and 42 seconds. This run had a really good early game, and he was ahead of a mid 257 pace by nearly a minute. The record at the time was a mid 258, so if he played consistently for the rest of the run, a 256 would have been achievable, skipping 257 entirely. Upon entering the second part of Gelato Beach, an unfortunate mishap occurred during the 100 coin shine. He activates the yellow switch near the top of the level, which spawns 20 coins on a hill. The strat is to slide down the hill to collect the entire middle row of them, and then to time a ground pound back onto the hill to avoid falling off. Then you just walk back up the hill to collect them before the timer runs out. Given the coin route speedrunners follow, if you don't collect at least 19 out of the 20 coins when the timer runs out, the remaining ones disappear, and you basically have to go around collecting backup coins, which is a significant time sink. After grabbing the first set of coins, Paper Mario did the ground pound and tried to go back up the slope to get the remaining coins, but he got a side flip animation. This caused him to slide down the slope instead of running up it. After a couple more slides down the hill, it was impossible for Paper to get all the coins. A total of 12 coins despawned, and now he would have to go around collecting coins that aren't in the speedrunning route, such as killing cataquacks and spraying birds on the tightropes for one coin apiece. He loses over a minute and a half on this section alone, and then unfortunately loses 40 more seconds on Delfino Shines, a lot of which was movement error in trying to get to the beach pipe. At this point in the run, his best possible time is a 2.57.35, so he would have to play almost perfectly for the last hour of the run to get a PB, let alone a 2.57. Coming out of the second part of Delfino, he makes up for the majority of his lost time, and is ahead by 7 seconds. He then plays a solid second part of Rico, saving 45 seconds, and his best possible time is just 6 seconds below a 2.58. All that's left is getting to Bowser, and clutching out the ground pounds. Wow, that was still 257. <laughs> God, I've never been so unsatisfied by a PB in my life. Ah, oh, dude, really? That's the first 257? Unbelievable. Uh, okay, so I'm bitter on the inside. I'm still obviously super happy I got 257. And in like half an hour, I'll probably be like, yeah, I got 257. That was fucking poggers. Let's go. I'll be back tomorrow to get 256. Until then, peace out, buds. This is going to be the first example of the video where a yellow strat is used at the end of a run. This was the old any percent speedrun of SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom by Shift, which doesn't utilize skee ball abuse to farm shiny objects. This run was before the trick was discovered, and was the first time Battle for Bikini Bottom was beaten in under 58 minutes. Shift was in the red for most of the early game, but then he saved a bit of time coming out of Spongebob's dream. He's up and down for most of the mid game, and towards the end of the run, he's about 5 seconds ahead of his PB coming out of the second part of Downtown Bikini Bottom. Unfortunately, he loses that time plus 7 seconds coming out of the second part of Jellyfish Fields. Upon entering Sandy's dream, Shift is about 8 seconds behind his 5809 pace, and according to his splits, his best possible time is just barely over 58 minutes. 
So how on earth did he barely get under 58 minutes? So this run is a trick at the end that can either save a lot of time, or completely kill it. The community dubbed this trick Fast Nut, which at the time was considered to be task only. It's a one frame bash boost off of the slide which allows you to get the golden spatula on top of the acorn very quickly. It was also considered to additionally be position perfect in precision, with no useful setup or knowledge regarding frames or angles. The only way Shift could achieve a new PB is to hit it flawlessly, so there was no harm in going for it, since a PB was basically out of the question by this point. Oh, I'm quick! <sighs> what? What? So that. <sighs> Holy shit. And he nailed it, saving about 15 seconds, which also knocked down his best possible time to 57 minutes and 48 seconds, so the sub 58 dream was very possible. He completes Flying Dutchman's Graveyard in 4 minutes and 12 seconds, which was a pretty sick segment time considering everything that can go wrong in the level. An additional 3 seconds is saved, and all that's left is Chum Bucket Lab. Ready for runs, guys. And that's all I have to say about that. All world records from this point included Fast Nut as a staple trick, until Skee Ball Abuse was implemented into the Any% percent route, making the trick obsolete. Next is a 100% speedrun of Jack 1 by Outrageous Josh. Over the last few years, Josh has solidified himself as the best Jack 1 speedrunner, currently holding all world records in all of the major categories. Earlier this year, he broke the 1 hour and 35 minute barrier in 100%, and it all came down to the latter part of the run. He was up and down throughout, but going into Mountain Pass, he was 24 seconds behind world record. Given the nature of the endgame, he would need a huge time save during this section if he wanted to achieve a 134. There's a trick that Jack runners do in the any% percent no lava tube skip category called tree hopping, and it goes something like this. You get full blue eco while driving a zoomer, and you jump off of a tiny slope on the ground and bounce off the top of a tree. If the bounce off the tree is good, you need to balance your zoomer midair and then hit a second tree at just the right angle. Then you land over a rock where there's a power cell waiting to be collected. Collecting the power cell by tree hopping versus intended mechanics saves about 25 seconds. This trick isn't completely routed in the 100% run since it's super inconsistent and also due to the fact you have to do it over an hour into the run. If you miss it, the run is essentially dead. So just like Shift's battle for bikini bottom run, Josh had nothing to lose, so he goes for it. Oh, let's go, dude. What the frick? Yo. And he smashed it, saving about 22 seconds after the split, also knocking down his best possible time by 20 seconds, so he has a bit of breathing room for the next 30 minutes. Coming out of Snowy Mountain, he was ahead by 20 seconds, and he even had new PBs for a couple of his splits during that section. Lava Tube is pretty standard for him, there's not a whole lot of time that he could have lost during that section. After Golemaya Citadel, he was up by 26 seconds, and all he had to do was finish the final boss. I have not been breathing. <laughs> I have not been breathing. Oh my god, dude! This category is so hard! <laughs> my legs! I can barely feel my legs! Next we have another Ocarina of Time speedrun. 
This is a 100% run by ZFG that also uses the old route without SRM. This was also the second world record run that incorporated a big route change at the time. For the first hour and 45 minutes, he's on a very good pace, ahead by almost a minute up until he approaches Dampe. As we know, Dampe can either make a good run bad, or a bad run good. By giving him 10 rupees, he'll dig up a patch of dirt, but there is only a 10% chance that he'll dig up a piece of heart, which is necessary for 100%. There are 8 mounds to dig from in the graveyard, and the game keeps track of how many attempts you've made. On your 15th attempt, it guarantees a success, but on average, it's actually faster to exit and reload the area, so the counter will always be reset to zero. ZFG's world record was 4 hours 10 minutes and 17 seconds at the time, and had a second try Dampe. This run, however, had a 12th try Dampe, costing him 3.5 minutes. Alright, well the run's dead, but I'll continue digging until Dampe gives it to me, just to see what number I get up to. Any predictions? During the next half hour, he would manage to save roughly a minute back. Although still behind, things were looking doable up until this specific room in Shadow Temple. So you need to use Link's hookshot to launch yourself in the air to collect silver rupees. For the last silver rupee of the room, which also unlocks the door, ZFG was too many pixels to the left and missed it. He lands near the re-dead in the room, which was a big problem. If the re-dead spooks Link, it will lock him in place for a few seconds, and if you don't hit it or get away fast enough, it'll spook him again. Since ZFG missed the shot and landed near the re-dead, it would go on to spook Link for about 40 seconds. In normal gameplay, you would just spend a second or two killing the re-dead, but because of the glitches that are used, Link doesn't have a sword equipped, so there's no easy way of killing the enemy. He did have Deku sticks, but they're a limited resource, so he wasn't able to use them. Oh my god, I've never missed that rupee falling. I'm so mad. I'm so mad, dude. I can't go in the door. That's never happened before. After finally getting out of the room, he's almost 2 minutes behind, so he's going to need a lot of time save to be able to PB. At over 2.5 hours into the run, the spot where he could finally catch a break was Spirit Temple. He messed up the cutscene skip in his PB, but nails it in this run. The other big time save was whether or not Twinrova would cooperate, and she did. He saves over a minute and a half on this section. Fast forwarding to almost 3.5 hours in, he saves time during the section when Link gets the bullet bag, golding the segment. This is also the first time since before Dampe that he was ahead of his PB. Right after this he did the Ocarina Memory game, which he had messed up in his PB. This small error was worth a whole minute of time save, and he did it this time with ease, also achieving another gold split. For the next half hour, the run was very good with no notable time loss, and all he had to do was defeat Ganon. That might have cost me 408. I think I'm still good. I think it'll be 408.59. Alright, never mind. So, this run had a 12th try Dampe. This means that I lost... Let me check how much time I lost at Dampe. Over 3.5 minutes, like 3.45. I lost 3.45 at Dampe. And I got a 408, so that's cool. <laughs> it's worth noting that he completely skipped the 4 hour 9 minute threshold. He's never seen a 409, and he never will. Here we have English Ben's speedrun of Grand Theft Auto Vice City in the any% no script stack underflow category. About 4 years ago, there was a skip found in the game which saved 40 minutes off of standard any%. It's pretty technical, but all you need to know is it saves a ton of time, and due to the nature of the skip, it prompted the leaderboards to be split. Ben had just achieved the new best segment time for the Copland mission, and was 11 seconds ahead of his PB, which was 54 minutes and 23 seconds. His best possible time was 54 minutes flat, but if he were to play perfectly to his best segment times for the remaining missions, and get at least 4 out of 5 fade skips, he could hypothetically get a 53 minute time. Fade skips are minor optimizations during something called insta-passing, which basically allows you to complete missions as soon as you start them. You can insta-pass entire assets in Vice City, and skip the entire second half of the game by doing this glitch. He says this during his run. What's funny now is if I play perfectly and get 4 out of 5 fade skips, I'll 53 this. Which is really funny. It's worth noting that if you fail fade skips at any point, the run is basically dead, making them extremely risky to go for. Now it's time for the late game, starting with the Spilling the Beans mission. 
It's usually pretty easy, but the only scary part is when you have to buy a property and start the rampage at the same time. This part is also cycle based, so if you get a really bad cycle which is totally out of your control and you pick up the rampage without buying the property, the run is dead. Doing this strat also means you cannot save before attempting the trick, so you only get one shot. He successfully gets through the trick and golds the mission by 3 seconds, so now his best possible time had just hit below 54 minutes. Keep in mind he still has to play perfect for the next 8 minutes, and the hit the courier mission is when he needs to do 4 out of 5 fade skips. The reason most Vice City runners don't do all 5 fade skips is because the first one is too difficult and risky to do. A fade skip creates a crossover between the fade in for starting the mission and the fade out from completing the asset glitch so you get them both at the same time. This process is very technical so I'll have a link in the description if you'd like to learn more about how the asset glitch and fade skips work. The window to execute them is pretty tight which is why it's difficult to even hit 4 out of 5 in a run. He manages to clutch 4 out of 5 and saves 4 seconds which was also his best segment ever for this mission. Up next is Cap the Collector which is easily the hardest mission in the game to do in a speedrun. There are 3 sets of collectors that come to steal your assets and you must kill them in sequence. The next set only spawns when the previous set is killed so it's vital to kill them as soon as possible. Ben starts out by lining up an almost pixel perfect shot to snipe the first collectors and he hits it. Then he snipes the second and third set of collectors that drive on fast motorbikes successfully. Now the shots themselves aren't difficult but nerves can play a big role in this section. He saves an additional 6 seconds here and now it's time for the keep your friends close mission. Just before starting it, you use a teleport glitch that you set up way before the start of Copland. It only works if you have collected less than 20 pickups from that point, such as guns, money, and save icons to name a few. After the teleport, the mission is on a timer until the final boss spawns. The gun that you use is efficient to kill him, but sometimes when he takes damage, he'll dive out of the way. Luckily, it didn't happen during this run, and Ben achieved the new personal best of 53 minutes and 59 seconds. Had it happened, it would have killed the 53 minute dream. Yes! Yes! Fucking yes! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god, I can't feel my fucking body! Oh my god! I cannot believe I'm 53 that! Holy fucking shit, dude! I cannot fucking believe I pulled that off! I, I literally said at the end of Copland, like, what's funny is if I get four out of five fade skips, I can 53 this. And I got them and I fucking did it. Holy fuck. Back in May of this year, Simply would achieve his first world record in the 120 star category of Super Mario 64 with a time of 1 hour, 38 minutes, and 28 seconds. Simply has been running the game for 8 years now, and all the hard work he had put in finally paid off. Not even 19 minutes into the run, we already have people in chat saying, this is the run. The early game is pretty standard, he enters the basement slightly over 23 minutes into the run, and he's up a few seconds coming out of Bomb on Battlefield. He saves an additional 11 seconds in Shifting Sandland, which is arguably one of the toughest levels in early game because of all the slight optimizations, such as the 8 red coin star. Simply also made a great video on that specific star, and I'd recommend watching it. Coming out of Vanish Cap, he's ahead by 22 seconds, but then unfortunately loses a good amount of time in Big Boo's Haunt. The next major obstacle is the 100 coin star in Dire Dire Docks, specifically the submarine section. A combination of precise wall kicks and tight platforming makes this one of the hardest stars in the game. It's also considered to be a major reset point in late game. Due to the nature of the level, he unfortunately loses all of his time save, plus an additional 13 seconds. The run is far from dead though, he still has all of upstairs to do, and there's definitely time save in a lot of the later levels. So going into Wet Dry World, he's 16 seconds behind his PB, and it wasn't until the end of Tall Tall Mountain he was finally in the green. Snowman's Land was one of the biggest highlights of the run, saving a whopping 27 seconds, also knocking down his best possible time by 2 seconds. During the cloud level, Simply unfortunately misses one of the red coins and it costs him 5 seconds. However, he's still on a great pace, so now it's time for TikTok Clock, and he's yet again in the green. In Rainbow Ride, he shaves off an additional second, and all that stands between him and a world record are Bowser throws. Please take my money. You deserve it, you fucking legend. Thanks. 
I did it. You did what? World record. Larry, you got the world record. <laughs> oh my wow. god, you got the world record? Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh my face. Oh my god, I knew it was coming. Oh my god. Hey, bud. Oh my god. What'd you get? What was your time? Oh my god. 138.28. Oh my god. So 11 seconds or 9 oh. seconds? <laughs> Guess who's number one in the world? Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! If you've seen Carl Jobs' video about this run, we all know that the only word to describe this ending is wholesome. Up next is a 1.14 random sea glitchless speedrun of Minecraft by Illumina. I've actually covered this run over on my personal channel in my Minecraft's Great Speedrunning War video. In that video, I documented the three main contenders of this speedrunning category, Illumina, Dream, and Real Ben X. In a span of 51 days, the world record was traded amongst the three of them over half a dozen times, but this particular run was one of the best highlights of the war due to how scuffed it was. The beginning of the run was pretty standard, it's optimal to spawn in a desert at the start and hope that there's a desert temple in viewing distance. This is because the strategy is to obtain TNT to blow up houses in savannah villages and then craft the wood into sticks to trade to the villagers to unlock enderpearls. After Illumina obtains everything that he needs for the early game, he heads off to the nether slightly over 6 minutes into the run, which was a decent pace. He immediately finds another fortress, and he has to bridge over to the part that has blaze spawners. Somehow, he ends up falling and dying. <laughs> Frick! <laughs> no! <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> Under normal circumstances when this happens, the run might as well be over, since in order to reclaim your items, you have to run back to where you died in the nether, which means you have to run back to where you made the portal. Luckily, the portal wasn't far from the initial spawn, so the run can still stay alive. He gets back, and while on the way to get his items, he was too far left on one of his jumps, and he dies again. Am I gonna die if I fall? Okay, well, crap. Okay, I think this run's dead. I think I killed this run. <laughs> All right, this run's unironically dead. This in total cost about two minutes, so now he's going to have to rely on a close stronghold and a good end fight. 17 minutes into the run, he finishes the villager trading, which despite the two minute time loss in the nether, was actually a pretty decent time. It only took him five minutes to locate the stronghold, which was also a fantastic time. There was also a critical moment that saved this run, and it's on his way to the end portal that he finds an ender pearl in a chest. As he dug down into the stronghold, he only had 8 eyes of ender, so he would have to bank on a 4 eyed portal, which is about a 1 in 47 chance. Since he found an ender pearl, he would now have to bank on a 3 eyed portal, which is about a 1 in 12 chance. If it's not a 3 eyed portal, the run is basically dead unless he magically finds another pearl or enderman in the stronghold. Miraculously, it's a three-eyed portal, and he enters the end slightly over 23 minutes in. The world record at the time was a 2644 by Dream, and given Illumina's skill level, he could easily whip out a sub four minute Ender Dragon fight. Let's see. I have a diamond sword, so I should be able to do lots of damage on him. Next time he goes on the center, so it's not a big deal. Uh-oh. Yes, 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 that was a good charge. You got the whole squad laughing with this record. <laughs> Just like that, he had achieved a new world record with a time of 26 minutes and 3 seconds in probably the craziest way imaginable. 
For our last entry, we have Tuval's speedrun of Spyro 1 Any% percent, and this is historically one of the greatest endings to any speedrun. After coming out of Dreamweavers, Tuval was 31 seconds behind world record, and the only way he'd ever be able to achieve it would be to perform the hardest trick in all of Spyro 1, Covalis. It's a trick where you skip both North Cove and Twilight Harbor by going around the back of Nasty's level entrance in the homeworld, getting a lucky flop into the air, and executing one of the hardest wall glides in the game in order to pass through the top of the sealed dragon head to enter the level early, saving a whopping 40 seconds. This trick is not only extremely inconsistent in runs, but there are top level runners who have never even landed the trick in practice. To actually do it first try in a run would be absolutely disgusting. So let's see what happens. What? Um... Hello? <laughs> okay. He does it first try, and then goes on to secure a new world record that would be unbeatable for over three years. Oh, did I mention Tuval was the one who found this trick in the first place? Just for context as to how hard this trick is, it's never been replicated first try in any any percent run since this, which was five years ago. This run was undoubtedly ahead of its time, and it still remains a top 3 time to this day. I would recommend watching the Rixxer's video about Tuval, the man who broke Spyro in half. It's a good watch and it documents Tuval's legacy in Spyro speedrunning, and heck, even covers his finding of Gelato Beach Skip in Super Mario Sunshine, a game he doesn't even run. Alright, this marks the end of the video, and if you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a thumbs up. I really enjoyed making this video, and as always, I want to give a big thank you to everyone that provided me with information for each of these games, they're all listed in the description. As I stated before, this list wasn't limited to the entries featured, so if you know of other great comebacks in speedrunning, let us know in the comments section. I'd definitely like to see more examples. If you're enjoying the content Easyscape and I put out, subscribe to the channel for more speedrunning related content. I also make speedrunning related content on my personal channel, so check it out if you're interested. A link will be in the description and in the end screen. That's it from me today, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.